先敬礼传承。First, let's pay homage to the lineage gurus. 敬礼了明和尚。Homage to the venerable Mang Liao Ming. 敬礼沙迦真空上师。Homage to Master Sakya 真空。十六世大八华王，卡玛。Homage to His Holiness the Sixteenth Kamapa。图登大吉上。And homage to Master Dubden Tarji。我们敬礼，坛城三宝。敬礼。Homage to the Three Jewels of the Altar。And homage to the main deity of the practice today。阿弥陀佛。阿弥陀佛。师母，师母，丹增嘎措，图登西帝，各位上师，丹增嘎措，教授师，法师，哦，大玛玛师，大玛 educators， 主教，堂主，大玛 teachers， 大玛 lecturers， 大玛 assistants。Directors of temples and chapters, and all disciples present here over the internet. Good evening, everyone. How do you do? Hello, everyone. I still. I still. Who is it? Hola, amigo. Hola, amigo. Te quiero mucho. Going, it's Eva. Jimmy, 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 Today, we watch TV Boye. The animation made by TV Boye. Um, I have some feelings about it. The academian Professor Zhu. After he left, his sarira is now placed at the Twin Lotus Columbarium at the Rainbow Temple. And after placing it there, his wife and son also came. And Professor Zhu and other daughter give a dream to the daughter, and you should go to Tantric Quarter. And Thank Grandmaster Lu. So the academian Professor Zhu uh, went into the dream of her daughter, his daughter. Uh, I mean, I don't deserve their gratitude because all sentient beings are equal. I, you, he or she are no different. There are no differences. If there is a difference, that's sentient beings. Only sentient beings differentiate. Until 
When you reach the realm of sagehood or bodhisattvahood, there is no differences. Today, I watch the animation produced by uh, Dipi Boye. That's how I this thought came to me. And one more point. Don't think that you would live a long life. Please don't think that everyone will live a long life. Actually, human life is very short. It's just a dream. After the dream passes, I am we will see each other at the Twin Lotus Columbaria. There is nothing to be contending about in this Saha world. It doesn't matter who you are. Like the Academian, Professor Zhu, he's an academian, which is higher than PhD, and he's internationally known. So his uh, uh, education is highest, the highest. Uh, don't think that those with uh, huge power or the wealthiest or the wealthiest man in the world or a beautiful girl like a goddess at the end we are all the same. No differences. So if you can find a direction and be diligent and put in your best effort and you arrive at the Buddha land, Amitabha's pure land, that would be most important. As for the rest, is garbage. All the rest is garbage. Rubbish. Not important at all. Nothing is important. Today I will first share This is not quite a joke It's more like an inspiration There's a man Asked Sakyamuni Buddha Buddha I split with my girlfriend, but I still miss her. What should I do? And the Buddha replied, put it down. Or let it go. And there's a woman asked the Buddha, the Buddha, my friend betrayed me, and I'm so upset. 
that I cannot uh, eat and sleep well. What should I do? And the Buddha said, put it down, let it go. And the man asked the Buddha, Buddha, there are millions of people in the world, or billions of people in the world, and there are billions of different kinds of problems. But the solution that you give them is all the same. Isn't that a joke? And the Buddha asked this man, Will you dream at night? And the man said, Of course. And the Buddha asked, Do you have the same dream every night? And the man said, That's not possible. I dream different things every night. And the Buddha said, you have slept for millions of times and you have mi millions of dreams. But uh, to stop the dreams is the same way, which is waking up. So, in order to free yourself from nightmares, the only way is to wake up. And all adversities in the human lives, for all the adversities in the human lives, the only solution is to put it down and let it go. This is not a joke. So this is what Sakyamuni Buddha said. Let it go. Put it down. So the disputes between people, the only way is to put it down, to let it go. If you cannot let it go, then you are just a sentient being. But if you can let it go, then you can have the attainment of a bodhisattva. Uh, so this is not a joke. This is an inspiration. Uh, it is uh, it gives the same kind of inspiration as the video clip of TB Boye. Now we will do the question and answer from Malaysia, Lian Hua Guangzong. Homage to the Dharma King Lian Sang. May peace be with you. Every year, we register ourselves for the blessing light, uh, the planet ruler protection, and also for longevity. And it is usually for the whole year. But if the restaurant died in the middle of the year, Typically, the registrations continue for the whole year. So in this way, if we do blessing lights for a deceased, will it affect or influence the deceased? Or will it give the same blessings to them? Thank you, Grandmaster, to resolve my confusion. In our temples, uh, people can register themselves for blessing lights, for planet ruler protection, or for longevity. But if the registrants died in the middle of the year, 
Will they be influenced or affected? Or will they still receive blessings? Will it hinder the disease? What kind of effect would it have on the disease? So let, let me tell this Lian Hua Guangzhong from Malaysia. Mm, it is right that you have such a thought, but in the eyes of Grandmaster, let me tell you frankly, <laughs> what am I telling you? There is no issue about life or death. If you have registered, you registered. If you died, you died. In the eyes of Grandmaster, or in Grandmaster's view, there is no such thing as life and death. You differentiate life from death. You think that only the livings would register for blessing lights or longevity? Blessings or planet ruler protection, but the deceased. Of course, you don't register the dead people for longevity or planet ruler protection or blessing light. You don't do that, right? Most people are like that. However, I'm you, so you have registered, you registered. He died, he died. There is no issue whatsoever. So, like I just said, let it go. Is there any power of blessing or power of hindrance? It doesn't matter. It's none of your business. They take care of themselves. You don't need to worry about them. Because if there's a hindrance, that's due to their own karma. There is a blessing that's because of his good karma. So that's all the function of his own karma. So if you say by registering for longevity, then you will not die. That's a big joke. Right? If you lit a blessing light, then you would definitely uh, be, will you have clear light? No, what a joke. Or if you register for the planet ruler protection, will you be definitely protected? That's a joke. Think about it carefully. 
That's the Dharma gate for peacefulness. You just give yourself peace. It's to give yourself peace. Of course, there's also the blessing of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. But in order for the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to bless you, it would be like uh, playing the baseball or hitting the baseball. The blessing of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas is like the batter, the batter of the baseball, and then all of a sudden there's a, a breeze that would uh, blow the ball so that it becomes home run. So that win is the blessing. So the um, the batter <laughs> of the baseball, that's yourself. That's yourself. And then the ball is a home run, or you hit the high ball and caught by someone. So that's like uh, every. It's like the fate or destiny of different individuals. They're all different. And the wind is the blessings of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So you should still register for the blessing light, for the planet ruler protection, and for the longevity. And with the blessings of the Buddhas and Bodhisattva, it's that wind that gives you a blessing. But you're still the one who hit the ball. So now you should understand my explanation. Still from Malaysia, Lianhua Xin Yi. The Pure Lands and Buddha Lands, although it is a pure land, but they still have rules to follow. It's not completely free. And free and under your control. Is that true? How can we be truly free and have self mastery? So if you go to the Buddha land and pure land, then you are completely free and in control of yourself. If you have arrived at the Buddha land, it's because you have abided by the precepts, because you have kept the precepts. So once you get to the Buddha land, of course you will not violate the precepts because there is no such place that would allow you to violate the precepts. So once you get there, naturally you will not violate any precepts. Naturally, the fish in water naturally can swim. The birds who fly in the sky can naturally fly. Everything is natural. So if you have arrived at the Buddha land, you are completely free and have self-mastery. You will not violate any precepts. Like the bird will not go to the bottom of water, or the fish float in the air, in the air. That will not happen, right? So rest assured. Pure land is pure land. The pure, pure Buddha land. 
So because it's pure Buddha land, a pure person, if a pure person gets there, of course you have self-mastery and completely free. There are no precepts or rules there, none. You think that by getting to Sukhavati, the Western Paradise, that you still have to go to the bathroom? Do you need and defecate? Uh, you have to dig a hole for you to crouch on? No. No. You think you have to do laundry there? Your heavenly garments uh, never uh, adulterated or contaminated by dust or dirt. And your body will naturally emit lights and perfume, fragrance, and they will never dissipate. So the celestial garments <coughs> will never get dirty. You don't need a washing machine. There's no rain. <laughs> that if you go back to your pal palace, you still need a dryer. Rest assured. It's completely free and self-mastery. Second question. So the dissipation of your soul is that a complete a kind of extinction? that you completely extinct, that you will not be reborn or reincarnation again, that you're completely gone. Is that right? See, this person has so much worries. Don't think about this. Don't think about dissipating soul or dissipated soul. Till one day, but because you have taken refuge in Grandmaster Lu, of course your soul will not dissipate. So, like what the Buddha said, just let it go, put it down. The first question and the second question. And the third question, I would really like to know if there is cause and effect for the above two. So in the Buddha land, although you don't generate karma, can the causes and conditions still cause one to be reincarnated? Let me tell you, the Buddha land is not returning. There's no rebirth or reincarnation. This is a superfluous question. So when it is extinct, does it mean it's all dissolved? <laughs> So it's like washing your hand in the golden basin. So it's like in the Jin Yong novels again. You have read too much Kung Fu novels. So let me tell you, Lian Hua Xin Yi from Malaysia, please let go all of your questions. These are questions. These are non-questions. Once you get to the Buddha land, it is not returning and will not enter the rebirth cycle again. 
because once you get there, each and every one of them will attain Buddhahood, Bodhisattvahood, or and or sagehood. I always think that my mom and dad don't like me until my 17th birthday they give me a chain of a one key a key and I was surprised and asked Did are you giving me a car? And my mom and dad said, no. You stay home, we are traveling. That's a joke. Let's uh, play the sea world and I am the, the, I am the animal and you're the trainer and what you have to do is to give me food. Okay, now we will uh, expand the Vajra Sutra. This uh, chapter 11 Supreme Merits Without Doing Without Doing What is Without Doing? Giving rise to the mind which is non dwelling, that's acting or doing without motive or effort. So, without dwelling, that's without doing. Oh, so we use comparison using merits and blessings blessings and merits as comparison this is chapter 11 Sakyamuni Buddha asks Sakyamuni Buddha often used similes or analogies. Subhuti, what do you think? Should there be as many Ganges rivers as there are grains of sand in the Ganges river, would the number of the grains of sand in those rivers be numerous? Some people do not understand the sentence. Pay attention. This is not necessarily easy to explain. Subhuti, what do you think? Should there be as many Ganges rivers as there are grains of sand in the Ganges river? Would the number of grains of sand in those rivers be numerous? Subhuti replied, very numerous, word on at one. The number of those rivers would be countless, even more so the grains of sand in them. And Sakyamuni Buddha continued, Subhuti, I shall tell you truthfully, if there is a good man or good woman, who fills the whole cosmos 
as many as those grains of sand with the seven kinds of precious jewels as an act of giving, would their blessings be tremendous? Subhuti replied, Tremendous indeed, what honored one. The Buddha told Subhuti, Should there be a good man or good woman who upholds this sutra and expounds it to others, even if it is only four verses, his merits and blessings exceed the former. So this is comparing blessings and merits. Sakyamuni Buddha really likes to use analogies to comparisons. One is Mount Meru, huge, tall and big. And he used Ganges River sand, or the sand in Ganges River, to symbolize numerous. If you've been to India, you would know Ganges River. Grand Master visited India and went to Varanasi. It's a 5,000-year-old ancient city, Varanasi, yes. And India is also one of the ancient uh, country or empire, Babylon, uh, Egypt, India, and Babylon has uh, disappeared, so we only have Egypt, India, China. So Varanasi is a 5,000-year-old ancient city. It's on the bank of the Ganges River, and the Indians refer to the Ganges River as a sacred river. Like for the Chinese, it's the Changjiang and the Huanghe, which is the Yellow River and the Long River. And for the Indians, uh, the Ganges River is the sacred river. So we were once on board a boat on the Ganges River in our tour. And Sakyamuni Buddha liked to use the sand in the Ganges rivers as an analogy. So Ganges River sands are countless because uh, Ganges River is across India and the sand in the Ganges River of course is uncountable. So it means infinite. So it's countless, it's innumerable. And then he added this, which many people do not know. Should there be as many Ganges River as there are grains of sand in the Ganges River? What does it mean? The Buddha said, so if each grain of sand is the same as a Ganges River, very few people understand this. So if we think that a grain of sand is one Ganges river, then would the number of grains of sand be numerous? That would be incredible. Even just the sand in one Ganges river is already countless. And then <laughs> that many Ganges river, how many of them? It's 
impossible to count. It means innumerable, innumerable, countless. That is just unfathomable. How many grains of sand? We can't even <laughs> count them. Sakyamuni Buddha likes to use this analogy. So it's infinite, it's impossible to count. He likes to use this metaphor. So Buddha said, it's numerous, it's infinite. You can't even count the rivers, moreover, the grains of sand. It's impossible to count. So that, that's what he meant. Many people, when reading this paragraph, they thought that uh, the Buddha was only talking about the Ganges River, but that's not the case. He was saying that there are many sand or uncountable sand in the Ganges River, and each grain of sand as if it's a Ganges River. So how many grains of sand are there? So Subhuti replied, it's impossible to count the number of the rivers. That's already countless. So the number of those rivers would be countless. Moreover, the grains of sand in the when some people read this, some people think that Sakyamuni Buddha was only <laughs> mentioning about the grains of sand in the Ganges River, but they did not know that each grain of sand is also a Ganges River. If you're not careful in chanting the Sutra, you may not know the figurative speech that Sakyamuni Buddha was talking about. Yeah, the sand is really numerous in the Ganges River. That's all you thought. You did not know what he was asking about. No. Where numerous hold on at one. The number of those rivers are already infinite, even more so the grains of sand. So these are all comparative. So many people who chant the Vajra Sutra, they think that they can memorize it. But uh, each grain of sand becomes a Ganges river, and in each of those rivers, there are also grains of sand. And Subhuti replied that you can't even count the rivers, moreover, the sands the grains of sand. Now you understand, right? So those who chant the sutra, if they are careless, they only think that the Buddha was only talking about the grains of sand in the Ganges River. They did not think that Sakyamuni Buddha made each grain of sand to become another Ganges River. <laughs> so he said here that all those Ganges rivers, why? You know, because Ganges River, only one. But why are we talking about those rivers? Because each grain of sand becomes one Ganges river. So Subhuti understood clearly and he was attentive to the words of Sakyamuni Buddha. And Grandmaster's explanation too is also very clear. So 
the number of Don't those rivers, that. meaning many, many rivers, already countless. So, even more so, the grains of sand in um, typically people who chant the sutra would miss this part. So San Ma Mount Meru is tall and Ganges River sand is numerous. These are the common metaphors that Sakyamuni Buddha frequently use. Uh, there is a sutra of the Buddha that's called uh, uh, a comparative uh, sutra. Um, it's like the parables. Parables. So Sutra uh, parables. <laughs> and some people say that the Vajra Sutra is the Diamond Sutra. <laughs> diamond. Uh, the English translation of the Vajra Prashnaparamita Sutra is Diamond Sutra. Because Vajra is very hard, it's indestructible. It's, un uh, uh, it's indestructible to destroy other things. That's the Vajra Sutra. So the uh, uh, for foreigners translated it into Diamond Sutra to use diamond as a metaphor for the Vajra. And diamond too is also very hard. So I have expounded, explained about the meaning of the Vajra Sutra. Vajra Sutra is the Sutra who destroys everything, everything. And here, the next Subhuti, I shall tell you truthfully, if there is a good man or good woman who fills the whole cosmos, as many as those grains of sand with the seven kinds of precious jewels as an act of giving, would their blessings be tremendous? Subhuti replied, tremendous indeed, what honored one. The Buddha told Subhuti, should there be a good man or good woman who upholds this sutra and expounds it to others, even if it is only four verses, his blessings and merits exceed the former. The Buddha told Subhuti, I truthfully tell you, if there is a good man or good woman who fills the whole cosmos as many as those grains of sand with the seven kinds of precious jewels. So what is what are the seven kinds of precious jewels in the sutra? It is in the sutra. Gold, one of them. Corals. Agate, uh, precious things Man from the human world, to fill 3,000 great thousand worlds, which is like a universe, and 3,000 great thousand worlds, which means like the whole universe, means many, it's already very many. So Sakyamuni Buddha often uses this metaphors. That's why, think about it, why Grandmaster only have five million disciples, which is five hundred Ten thousand. That means many. So Sakyamuni Buddha often stated, said, 
like 500 traders or 500 merchants on the river. Does that mean only exactly 500? No, it means many. So many camels, caravan, passing, crossing the Ganges River. And the Buddha also said 500 arhats. Does it mean only 500 of them? No. It means many, many arhats. It's referred to as 500. So I use the same figure of speech that Grandmaster has 500, 10,000 disciples, which is 5 million. But in Chinese, it's 500, 10,000 disciples. It did not decrease or increase to become 6 million, which means many, many disciples. So I use the same figure of speech as Sakyamuni Buddha. I learned from him. We often heard 500 merchants, um, 500 uh, bandits, 500 arhats, and Grandmaster uses the same figure of speech. 500, 10,000 disciples. Many people ask, you know, why after so many, after so long and so many more disciples, how come it stays five million disciples? No, that's not the case. It just means many. So countless seven precious jewels and fills the whole cosmos as many as those grains of sand as an act of giving. Would the blessings be tremendous? Of course, it's tremendously tremendous. <laughs> so of the six parameters, giving is the f first. So his or their blessings would be tremendous. And Subhuti replied, tremendous indeed, World Honored One. The Buddha told Subhuti, should there be a good man or good woman who upholds this sutra and expounds it to others, even if it is only four verses, his blessings and merits exceed the former. This is a comparison. If there is a good man or good woman who upholds the four verses from the sutra, no phenomena of self, of no phenomena of others, no phenomena of sentient beings, and no phenomena of lifespan, you uphold these four verses and you expound it to others, the merit, the blessings and merits exceed the blessings and merits of the act of giving of the seven precious jewels filling cosmos as many as those grains of sand. Far exceed. So this is Chapter 11, Supreme Merits Without Doing. So if a human being can reach the state of no phenomena of self, then he's already a sage. Seven precious jewels of the world and that many is lost to the no phenomena of self. Moreover, all four of them, no phenomena of self, others, sentient beings, and lifespan. If you uphold this four, then you are a sage and you are a bodhisattva then you are a sage, a bodhisattva. What kind of afflictions will you have if you have no phenomena of self? You don't have any view of self. 
You are afflicted, you worry because you have this view of self. If self or I don't exist, what are you afflicted about? Do you still worry about your own ailments? Because if self or I don't exist, where would the illness be? So human beings uh, worry about uh, disputes and true and false and rumors because there's you, there's I. So there's a minister in Taiwan that said, whenever there's a human being, there's always that talk, true and false. But if you have no view of self or no view of a person, then there's no no talks, no true and false, no afflictions. That's really wonderful. So you should learn to be no self. If you uphold the no self, then the other no non phenomena will naturally appear. Therefore, Grandmaster Lu gets drowsy easily on the Dharma throne because that's no phenomena of self. I even said, please make this Dharma throne into a bed and then give me a pillow and a blanket and I would sleep. But uh, Grandmaster Lu, you, you should give Dharma teaching. Why are you sleeping here? You're chanting down there and I'm sleeping up here. Why? How can you be like that? No, you don't have a dignified look. I don't have any look. I have no no appearance of self. Or why do I care whether I look dignified? I appear dignified or not. Mm, to sleep, and then when I wake up, I give Dharma teaching. So it's okay. Grandmaster has no worries, no afflictions at all, no cares. Because who cares? Who cares? <sighs> what is it about? It's your business. It's totally unrelated to me. It's none of my business. I often think this way. Then I gradually enter into the state of no phenomena of self. People say that uh, elderly have difficulty falling asleep. But for me, as I grow older, I sleep better. I always feel I don't get enough sleep. I sleep so well. I cannot uh, get up at in the morning. At night, I would put the sumo to bed, to bed and cuddle her, and then after she falls asleep, I would uh, tiptoe back to my room. But every morning, she would wake me up. And she'd say, today is Saturday. Or today is Sunday. You have to go to Rainbow Temple. <laughs> and I told her, I'm taking a break. I'm taking the day off. But I still got up. I still have to be diligent. I have to give them a teaching. I always say, uh, get a day off, but I still get up.
So human life is like this. Non dwell non dwelling, that's wonderful. Doing without motive or exertion or there's no wise. No, not just because I just do what I'm supposed to do. In the future, I will talk about this. That this the Vajra Sutra is truly about no view, no phenomena, no appearance of self, others, or person, sentient beings, and lifespan. We will talk more about it in the future. The Master is giving Dharma teaching here, but am I? Have I given Dharma teaching? Even if I give Dharma teaching, it's the same as not giving Dharma teaching. And because I don't give Dharma teaching, I am giving Dharma teaching. Does the Dharma exist? If you go to the moon, is there Buddha Dharma there? The moon is no phenomena of, of human beings because there are no human beings on the moon. How could there be Buddha Dharma there? How could there be I? Is there sentient beings? Are there sentient beings there? No. Are there human beings there? No. Are there uh, people who live a long life? No. Uh, what, what, uh, what does time matter to you? What use is time for you over there? Is there any use? Lifespan is time. And phenomena of sentient beings, that's space. Over there, Grandmaster said, the whole <laughs> land, all the land on the moon is a mine. Do you want to buy? I'll, I'll sell some to you. The master would earn a lot of money. I will sell the properties on the moon. And I would write that Sung Yen Lu would sell in Taiwan as jia, but acres here. And to sell it to you, then you would become a landlord. With this piece of paper, it will prove if one day you get on the space shuttle and said, see, the master Yu Lu sold me this piece of land right here. And then you would have this certificate, a proof that I am uh, the master or the landlord of the moon. No use. Over there, no phenomena of self, of humans, of sentient beings, of lifespan. After I sold the moon, I would sell the uh, Saturn and Mars and uh, Pluto and Venus. I don't want any land on Earth. I would uh, sell the planets. And <laughs> I will also sell <laughs> certificates for uh, birth on the pure land. And I will sell the boat tickets if you want to get on my on my uh, Dharma boats uh, to get to the 
uh, Western pure land of Atmos Bliss. But let me tell you, you know, in Sukhawati, all those tickets are useless. Why would I want to sell them to you? So, uh, uh, like a murderous spirit is what is like when your wife called your full name. So I use a lot of uh, analogies today. What is uh, no view of self, others, sentient beings, and lifespan? From the Saha world to go to Sukhawati, the ship ticket is your purity. Your purity is your ship <laughs> ticket. That's all for today, Amani Benihan. <laughs>